You're watching Going Up, a weekly show focused on sharing the truth of Jesus in a way that is applicable to your everyday life. Going Up is filmed at Elevate Christian Church. Join us for gatherings every Sunday at 9 or 1030, where we have live music, take communion together, and where you can be a part of a community focused on connecting people with God and each other. Enjoy! Uh, I want to begin by telling you a story that I I read. Um, It's about a woman uh, and and her family quarreling with the neighbors for quite some time. Uh, They they had had all kinds of differences. They've gotten into arguments, and, and so they didn't have the best relationship. And so one day she was looking out her window, and she was horrified to see that her German shepherd Uh, was attacking uh, their family pet, which was a bunny rabbit. In fact, she was horrified to see it was shaking the life out out of this poor rabbit. And so she grabbed a broom and ran out there and began to beat her dog until he dropped the rabbit, now covered in dog spit and mud and extremely 100% dead. And she thought to herself, what in the world am I going to do? I mean, our, our neighbors already hate us, and, and now our dog has killed their, their bunny rabbit, their, their pet. And so she grabbed the rabbit up, and she took it into her house, and she took it into the bathroom and started to run water in the bathtub, and she began to wash the rabbit off really well, wash all the mud and the dog spit off, turn the rabbit over and, and wash that side really, really good. And then her plan went further. She got out her blow dryer uh, and a comb, and she began to primp and and comb the rabbit and and dry him. And when she got done, it looked pretty good. And so her neighbors were not home yet, so she climbed the fence and she crept over to, to the little rabbit pen where they kept the rabbit. And she put him in there and propped his legs up. So he was sitting there looking like, like he was alive. And she said, there's no way with all the friction between our neighbors that I'm going to take the blame for this. Well, about an hour later, she heard screams coming from her neighbor's yard. And so she ran outside pretending that she didn't know what was going on. And her neighbor came running to the fence. All the blood had rushed from her face. And she said, you won't believe it. Our rabbit, our rabbit, he died a week ago. We buried him, and now he's back from the dead. (laughs) Um, This morning, I want to talk to you (laughs) about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is, to me, the single most life-changing event in the history of mankind. And I'm going to say this, I think it's even more important than the cross. Because the cross of Jesus is important, but without the resurrection of Jesus, the cross is meaningless. He has just died in vain. And so we talk in the, in the context of the church a lot about the cross, but we don't talk enough about the empty tomb. So if someone were to ask you personally, what does the resurrection mean to you? Uh, I would guess that your answer would probably align with most people surveyed. Most people ask what the resurrection meant to them answered by saying it shows God's power over death. And it absolutely does. But I want you to think about something. By the time Jesus is crucified, God had already displayed his power over death through many healings, through many miracles, and even including raising Lazarus from the dead. And so the resurrection of Jesus is more than simply a display of God's power. In his best-selling book, The Twisted Scripture, uh, Andrew Farley makes this point. He says, much of what we hear about to, uh, here today about salvation focuses on the cross. And the net result is that we often fail to grasp the deeper meaning of the resurrection. So think about your life before you met Christ. Before salvation, you and I, before we were saved, we had two problems. Our sins 
and our spiritual death. <clears throat> the sins we committed were merely a symptom of our core problem. Our spirits were dead inside of us. And so we had these two problems. And God is in the problem-solving business. And so the two problems that we had, God offered us two solutions. First, Jesus' death and the blood that was shed on the cross washed away our sins once and for all. And so, yes, the cross brought us forgiveness, and we rejoice in that. But without the resurrection, we would still be spiritually dead. It's the resurrection of Christ that solves this second problem, bringing us into new life. And so the, those of you who are Elevate members or regular attenders, you, you hear this quite often. Um, every single one of us were born with a body. We were born from our mother's womb. We have a physical birth. Inside of us, as the, because of the result of the fall of man, we were born with a physical body, but our spirits were dead. And so we were literally walking dead men, walking dead women. When Jesus saved us, he not only washed away our sins, but he entered into us and he resurrected the spirit inside of us. So indeed, we are now able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Jesus saved us and then raised that dead spirit back to life. So, so in short, I would say it this way. We're forgiven by his death. And brought into new and abundant life by his resurrection. And so the Apostle Paul writes a lot of the Bible. And he writes a lot about the resurrection. Uh, we would be here a month of Sundays if we examined all of his passages. But I want to direct you to one specific passage that Paul writes. It's in Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5 verse 10, listen to what Paul says. He says... For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now, we are, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And what he's talking about is his resurrected life. And so Paul is saying that, that the cross was just the beginning, that Jesus died for us, uh, and, and he washed our sins away. He died for us while we were enemies with God. And we were reconciled. We were brought into good standing by the work of the cross. And we are forgiven. Instead of punishing us for our sins, Jesus took on that punishment. But the Apostle Paul is much like the old broadcast radio host Paul Harvey. He's about to tell us the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is is that we are actually saved by his resurrected life. In other words, if Jesus would have stayed in the tomb, there wouldn't be anything else he could do for us, right? A dead man can't help you do anything. A dead man can't help you mow your lawn. He can't help you wash your car. You can't have a conversation with him. Uh, there's, there's, one, there's one thing in common with a dead person. They just lay there. They cannot do anything for you. And if Jesus had just laid in the tomb and three days later they found his body, we would be in a whole different scenario. But, but look at the end of that verse I just read you. After he talks about the redemptive work of the cross, he says, Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And so what Paul is doing is he's moving into the power of the life of Jesus, this resurrected Jesus Christ. And so I would say it this way, our souls are saved by the cross, but our spirits are awakened by the empty tomb. About 10 or 12 years ago, I got a phone call that no preacher ever wants to get. No person ever wants to get this phone call for, for, for that matter. Um, it was one of our church members who had gotten into a, an extremely bad car accident. Um, his name was Chris Rosamond. Chris and Holly Rosamond worship here with us. And by the time I got the call, they were rushing Chris to uh, Grady Hospital to the trauma center there. Uh, he had a, a pretty significant head injury. And so when they got Chris to the hospital, 
the first thing that the doctors and the nurses did is they worked to save his life. They worked to stabilize him. They worked to make sure that he wasn't going to pass away. And so Chris's life was saved, but he was not yet awake. He was in a coma for some time. Now, by the power of God and a lot of prayer from from the wonderful people here at Elevate Christian Church and the the wonderful doctors and nurses at Grady, eventually Chris woke up. Now, his life was saved, but it took a while for him to wake up. And listen, the cross is beautiful. I am certainly not taking anything away from that. But the cross can only take us so far. It is the resurrection of Jesus that awakens us to a life full of purpose. It's the resurrection of Jesus that makes our life worth living. It's the resurrection of Jesus that gives us hope for the future. Jesus paid our debt by the cross, but he awakened our dead spirit by the resurrection. And so this is why the resurrection is so profoundly important to Christians. Because it reminds us that Christ came to offer us, hear me, both mercy and deserved punishment. While grace, by definition, is the act of endowing unmerited favor. So I would say it this way. When my my sons were younger, uh, they liked to play with my tools. And, uh, you know, tools are not cheap. And they would take them and they would drag them off in the neighborhood and they would lose them a lot. Uh, and I, you know, I would, I would be pretty upset. And, and my first instinct is, I, man, I want to punish them. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm going to ground them. I'm going to do something. Uh, but I, a lot of times I didn't. I didn't punish them. Now, they deserved to be punished because they knew they weren't supposed to mess with them. But I had mercy on them. I said, all right, it's forgiven. Don't worry about it. You deserve to be punished, but, but I'm not going to punish you. Now, if I were to take it a step further and practice grace with them, I would say, not only am I not going to punish you, but here's a thousand dollars. I'm I'm just going to bless you. Okay. So that's the difference between mercy and grace. So think of it this way. In his mercy, God does not give us the punishment we deserve, which is namely eternal separation, hell, eternal death. While in his grace, God also gives us what we do not deserve, Namely, the riches of heaven found in and through the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. And so the cross brought us mercy and the resurrection of Jesus Christ enters us into the arena of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ's resurrection is a very, very important thing. And like I said, I only have a few minutes here. So real quickly, uh, there's two things that the resurrection of Christ teaches us. And I think we can rejoice and we can hold on to these two things. The first thing is simply this. Christ is our life. Let me say that again. Christ is our life. He's not part of our life. He is our life. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures and then we'll, we'll chat a minute. These are the words of Jesus in John 14, 19. Jesus says, yet a little while... And the world will see me no more. In other words, Jesus is letting his disciples know that he's about to check out. He's about to be crucified. No, it goes over their head. They don't really grasp it until it happens. But he says, listen, the world's not going to see me anymore. But look what he says next. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. Go to Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul writes this. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Translation, Jesus beat death and and he was resurrected. Jesus paid your sins on the cross and woken up your spirit. And because the resurrection of Jesus went through, the resurrection of you will go through. And so you are going to have life. And the only life that you're going to have is in me, is in Jesus. The author of Hebrews puts it this way. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he, being Jesus is able to save you 
What's that next word? Forever. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. What I want you to notice is this. The length or the time period of your salvation is entirely dependent upon the, the length of the life of Jesus Christ. As long as Jesus is alive, you have hope. As long as Jesus is living, you will live forever. Now let me ask you a question. How long will Jesus live? Forever. You see, we're saved by having his life. His life is eternal. So eternal life is not some gift package awaiting us in heaven. Eternal life is the life that was lost in the Garden of Eden and regained and given to us through Jesus Christ. He is indeed the air we breathe. He is our lifeline, our life in Christ. And it's in Christ because he's alive. If he was in the tomb, there would be no reason to be here this morning. So the second truth is this of the, re of the resurrection that I want to, you to walk away with this, this morning. Um, and it's about eternal life. And, and, and here's what it is. E eternal life is not our life made longer. It's our life made better. You understand that? Eternal life is just not our life made longer. It is our life made better. Now, we know eternity is forever. You can't get any longer than that. There is no such thing as forever and a day. Forever never ends. However, in terms, when we talk about eternity and eternal, eternal life, we often look in terms of quantity, and we need to look in terms of quality. Look what Jesus says in John 10.10. 10. He says the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. Now, who's the thief? The thief is the devil. We've been in this, this like three-month series talking about this. So your relationships, the devil wants to kill them, destroy them. Um, your finances, he wants to kill and destroy that. Your self-worth, your self-esteem, your value, it's his responsibility. It's his job. It's his lot in life to try to kill that, to steal your joy, to destroy your spirit. But Jesus says, I came that they may have life and they might have it abundantly. So Jesus said that he came to give us life. And I think when we read this scripture, we often view this abundant life that Jesus is talking about in future tense. Like, well, you know, I can't wait to get out of this world. One day I'm going to die and I don't have to worry about it. And then, you know, real life, real abundant life uh, will, will begin. When eternity starts, then I'll have abundant life. So let, let me ask you a question. When does eternity start? Eternity doesn't start for you when you die. It started for you when you were saved. Your spirit was brought back to life. There's this beautiful passage in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 where it says that, that God has set eternity into the hearts of men. I, I believe that happens upon salvation. When he raises our spirit from the dead, he sets eternity in our hearts. And so we know that even though in this world we will have trouble, in, the, in this world we will struggle, in this world the devil will try to steal, kill, and destroy everything valuable to us, but we hold on to Jesus Christ because we've read the end of the book. We know that Jesus defeated death and we know that because he defeated death, we will defeat death as well. So this life in Jesus, this abundant life in him, it's not a futuring thing. It begins when we're saved. It's a promise that we can walk in the blessings of God now and forevermore. Jesus makes our life abundant, which means he makes it plentiful and purposeful. He takes care of our needs and he gives us purpose in life. When we die, and there's a news flash in case you, you know, have never been to church and no one's ever told you this, you're going to die. Happy Easter, right? 
Like we're all going to die. But when we die, if we're in Jesus, we don't end. We follow the same path of Jesus. We die and we'll be raised from the dead. The, this promise should naturally make life more abundant for us, right? Because we walk around with confidence. We walk around knowing that we have victory over death. In a real sense, God's going to shred death to pieces. It's going to be unrecognizable for us as his children. So one day, they're going to put me in the ground, right? I'm going to die. And I plan to be buried in this old red clay down here in Georgia one day. And when I die, uh, some of you, if you're still alive, <laughs> will come to my funeral. And after, after whoever preaches my funeral, I don't even know who's going to do it, uh, you'll go next door to the fellowship hall and you'll eat egg salad and ham salad. And you'll reminisce about me and the good, the bad, and, and the ugly. When I die and I'm put in the ground, my physical body will be rendered useless. But make no mistake about it, I will be very much alive. This is the hope. This is why we gather. This is why we're here. And not only that, I'll be given a new and a glorious body. When I'm gone from this earth, my life is going to be much better because I have the promise of being resurrected no matter where they bury me. Reminds me of a story I heard about a man. <clears throat> he decided to take his wife on vacation, but he also had to take his mean, cantankerous, cranky, troublesome, bitter mother-in-law with them. And so it was the man, his wife, and his mother-in-law, and they decided to go on vacation to the Holy Land and, and to see where Jesus walked and to, and to be where Jesus was. And while they were there... The mother-in-law passed away. The under, he met with an undertaker, and the undertaker said, Listen, we can have your mother-in-law shipped home. It's going to cost about $20,000. Or you can bury her here in the Holy Land for $250. And so the man thought long and hard about it, and he told the undertaker, No, we're going to have to have her shipped home. And the undertaker said, why in the world would you do that? Why would you spend $20,000 to ship your mother-in-law home when, when she could be buried in this, this wonderful place known as the Holy Land for only $250? And the man said very sternly, listen, a man died here 2,000 years ago. They buried him here, and three days later he rose from the dead. I'm not taking that chance with that old battle axe, right? So, just a side note, my mother-in-law is here this morning, uh, and she's a beautiful woman of God. Uh, she is nothing like this lady at, at, at all. But, but I tell you this to say, listen, there's nothing magic about the soil in Israel. There's nothing magic about the, the, the holy land. The holy man has left the holy land, and he resides in you. You understand that? And so it doesn't matter where they bury you, in the holy land, in Georgia, in a ditch, it doesn't really matter because if you're in Christ, you will be raised from the dead just like Jesus defeated death. And so that's why we celebrate the empty tomb. That's why we cling to Jesus. That's why we rejoice in this life. Because of the resurrection, your life in Christ has already begun. It doesn't mean that life on this side is going to be easy. It means, though, that you can walk in the fullness of his mercy and his grace because you know that because Jesus rode, rose from the dead, you will have not only eternal, but abundant life. This is what Easter is all about. Christ is our life, and that life is abundant. And this is only made possible through the resurrection. So I got one final passage I want to read to you, and it's a little lengthy, so I'm going to do my best to, to not provide commentary. And I kind of want to let the passage stand on its own a little bit. Paul is writing about your resurrection, about my resurrection, about how we will physically be raised from the dead. And here's what he says, picking up in 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So let, let, let me, I told you I wasn't going to commentate, but I lied. Um, like... <laughs> 
If you don't believe in the resurrection, why are you here is essentially what he's saying. Like it's not enough just to believe that Jesus died for you. You have to understand that, that he defeated death for you. Does that make sense? Verse 13. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is in vain. In other words, I think what he's saying here is, is if you believe in the cross, but you don't believe in the resurrection, then your faith is dead. Your faith, that, that kind of faith can't save you. For Verse 15, for even, in, even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, those who've already died, they have no hope either. Verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, if the resurrection didn't happen and you come to church, you, you're, you are participating in the lamest hobby on earth, right? You're just here for, for, for no reason. There would be no point to this. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, the only thing that we would have to look forward to on Easter were boiled eggs and ham. That, that, would, that would be it on Easter Sunday. So I love how Paul finishes, up, finishes this up, and this is the message I want to leave with you. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, in other words, we are all descendants of Adam, we all are cursed by the sin, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. I was in Knoxville, Tennessee Friday, on Good Friday, and um, I was in a camera shop, and I was talking to this, this young lady, uh, and I, I know her pretty well, she's an acquaintance of mine, she's about 30, 32 years old. Um, and I know that she's not a believer, and so when I'm up there, I always try to talk to her a little bit without, you know, being pushy. And, and so I said, hey, are, do you have, are you looking forward to Easter? You got big plans this Sunday for, you know, for Easter? And she said, oh, yeah, I can't wait. I said, so what are you doing for Easter? She said, I'm going to sleep in, and then I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to eat Peeps and Cadbury eggs all day. I can't wait. Listen, I don't like Peeps. Like this little marshmallow, ugh, <laughs> yuck. That's all she had to look forward to. Waking up, sleeping in, and eating candy all day. <clears throat> Friends, I'm here to tell you that if you're in Christ, you have so much more to look forward to than that. You have the hope of eternal and abundant life. Paul says we are made alive through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I, I leave you with this question as we go into our response time. Have you been made alive? That's all for now. If you want to stay connected to everything we do at Elevate, be sure to follow us on social media and check out our website, elevatecc.com. Until next time, God bless you and keep going up.